Alex Lott, I'm the uh, Secretary of Unions ACT. I was elected uh, in November last year, and uh, prior to that, I was the campaign director at Environment Victoria, and I um, have uh, before that worked uh, for a couple of different organisations. So I was, uh, worked for the uh, Obama campaign in Boston in 2012, leading up to the presidential election there. Worked for the um, NTU and the United Voice, and was the LHNU as uh, campaigns. And uh, worked for Slater Board and doing all the union services stuff, although I should say I'm not a lawyer, so please don't put that against me. Uh, and uh, uh, I've also been involved with um, Greenpeace and Wilderness, um, which are the, you know, as you know, um, fairly large uh, campaigning environmental organisations. Uh, and I've done a bit of work over the years, uh, I suppose, talking with unions and working with uh, a couple of different unions about um, digital campaigning, in particular back in 2008 when this kind of stuff was fairly new, and a um, uh, big part of what Slater and Gordon had been doing was work with uh, unions they had as clients uh, to, to, I guess, improve or uh, boost their their digital and other, other campaigning uh, activities. And part of what I did uh, in the early uh, early days of the We Are Union campaign with Big Trades Hall, so based in Melbourne, uh, was get, uh, get a lot of that uh, early work set up for their, for their campaign. And then um, uh, was involved uh, later on with the uh, one I was asked to have a bit of a chat about was the um, few different things. One was, uh, I suppose, the, the challenge that, that we've got uh, with signing up new members and um, growing, growing the movement and using new tools. There's a range of different uh, challenges that we we'll face. And I think that um, although there's a lot of different industries and a lot of different demographics, uh, increasingly the, um, I think, the, the details might be the same, but the core challenges are very uh, similar. And uh, if we just go to the next the slide, I might just outline some of the, um, what, what I see and what people at the unions uh, told me what the challenges that they're facing. And certainly, uh, when I was at Sliders, uh, this is what I would see very often across all the different industries that uh, the unions operate in. The top level, Really seeing that um, business is increasingly, and you know, for a long time, but uh, increasingly uh, shifting costs or their, their business costs onto workers. So we see the rise of um, precarious work. Uh, you end up with uh, a lot of uh, working people in jobs that they don't see necessarily as a career. So they're not investing in the industries that they're working in. Services, or it might be flying fly out, so they might only imagine themselves or see themselves in the job that they're doing uh, for a couple of months or a couple of years. They don't see it as a long term investment. And as a result, they are either unaware of the existence of unions in the workplace or they don't see unions as, uh, as relevant. And, as, and then they don't join. So, those are, the, I think, the, the challenges that we're we're facing. There's a range of other challenges that we, we've got, like you know, hostile governments, uh, you know, businesses that might be exceptionally hostile uh, above the norm. But I think the uh, general issue is to do with uh, relevance and uh, and awareness. So we're just not seeing uh, people aware of unions, and if they are aware of us, they don't see why they should join. So. Uh, we just go to the um, the next area. These are the areas that I'm just I'm going to cover, cover on. So this is how we're going to, uh, my view, and I think you know you all uh, would have your own views about this. Uh, so I'm not uh, trying to tell you how to run uh, your organising, but I, I guess I'm just raising these as um, really as questions for you to pose when you go back to your uh, when you go back to your office and you, you talk to your staff. So, see, in order to respond to the challenge that I just raised, I think we need to understand uh, workers in the new economy and particularly about uh, the issues, the relevance issue. 
I think uh, one of the areas that I've observed is that um, where we could do better and understand really who our competition is as um, as unions. And I think you know there's a lot of unions that might see demarcation issues as uh, other unions as competition. Um, but what uh, what are the issues that one of the areas that was discussed at the Congress is about um, you know the, the new economy and the digital economy and disruption and under, understanding those incipient threats, the things things that really aren't quite on the radar but are just across the, the horizon. And we're starting to see that with services like Uber uh, in terms of how work is changing, but there's will be big uh, threats to unions coming out of um, the digital economy. I want to have a bit of a chat with you about what levers that we might uh, pull in order to respond to these things, and then maybe a little I'll, um, finish up with uh, a little bit about digital. And I know a lot of unions, uh, certainly when I started talking about this to unions back in 2008, there's been a lot of movement, a lot of uh, advances uh, in how unions do digital campaigning and uh, responding digitally, but I think there's still more that we can do in this role. Uh, the peak bodies that play in this. Uh, so I might just start with the, the audience, and when I say audience, I mean uh, there's two there's two areas I see key for unions. You've got uh, potential members, and then you've got potential supporters. So there's people who are that you've got coverage for that you want to sign up for an audience, and then we run campaigns in the public domain, public uh, space. It might be an election campaign, or it might be a campaign about shipping or jobs or. Uh, might be you know, the gas reserve or whatever the issue might be. So we've got, we've got people who are supporters. And the, there's a lot that, um, I think, uh, there's a lot of consultants out there uh, and media consultants that talk about you know, demographics and um, the, you can get sort of caught up in, in that. I think we need to go back to really basic stuff, which is uh, starting with me. So one of the areas that I've talked with a lot uh, of unions about is something about young workers, for example. And you know, do are young workers different from other workers to sign up uh, for the union? And my view is that uh, young workers and workers who are in precarious roles and whether it's um, they're in finance or uh, they might be in service jobs or cleaners or uh, call centres or you know casualised. Um, you know, labourers, day labourers on the construction site, they've got the same desire as every worker to have respected work, to have dignity of work and to get uh, a decent wage. So if we, we don't need to uh, break up our, the way that we talk about uh, members or audiences, about demographics or psychographics or other stuff that uh, consultants try to sell us, and particularly when you go out to a union that buys advertising, often they'll, they'll try to uh, talk to you about those things. I think we need to get back and say, really, what is the core business of uh, joining a union, being a union member? So once again, I'm not, uh, I probably wouldn't blow your socks off to hear that, but um, all the stuff we hear about, age, the, the gender, geography, all of that is, I think, secondary to the need of what a worker in the workplace actually wants. So so there's issues. It's, when we talk about issues, it's, you know, but, uh, that's, it's still the most important thing. Whether someone joins or not, supports or not, Based on their need for dignity, or it might be it might be a health and safety issue. So those are the issues that we really need, rather than um, trying to be fancy and um, talk differently to uh, different, different groups of potential members based on their age. The other thing, though, I should emphasise is that the new technology that we've got available to us, whether it's our membership databases or communications digital tools, does mean that we can personalise things. A lot more. So I know there's still a lot of unions that put out emails or put out um, letters that say dear member rather than dear job. So being more and more personalised uh, and focusing on need is the key relevance. So when we talk about one of those key challenges of being relevance, uh, stopping being homogenous, stopping sending out, rather than sending out the same newsletter or the same communication to all of your members, Personalise it to the industry, personalise it to the need, the specific need that is going on with that workplace is going to mean that you're going to get a greater bang for your buck. So it's a bit more difficult, a bit more complicated at the office end, but you're actually going to get a bigger 
uh, break them up. Particularly if you're talking about supporters as well, going back, personalising things for them. So we'll just um, talk about uh, the next slide, slide five, which is about positioning. So what I mean by positioning is where your union sits in the mind of your member or your potential member of your supporter. So if you don't know what position you hold in the mind of the person you're trying to communicate to, then it's very difficult to communicate with because you're not talking the same language. The key, the four key elements of position I've just laid out there, um, the first bit is your promise. So if you, as a union, aren't clear on what is your promise to your potential members that is unique, that is simple to understand, then it's going to be very difficult. And if your, your organisers and the staff and your delegates can't articulate your promise, then you're going to have a very difficult time in communicating with your potential members. And the determining your promise is actually really difficult to do. It's hard to sit down feel a bit weird trying to you know, get all your organisers or your elected officials together and say, what is it? What is the one key promise that we're making? It's really hard to do, but it's the cheapest thing to do because it costs no money. It just costs time, an hour or two or three, uh, sitting down and trying to knock that question out. The next bit is awareness. And this is the, the easy bit, and it, but it's the expensive bit. So a lot of unions, it's really easy to pump out posters, uh, stickers or um, some unions can afford advertising. Uh, it's really easy to put those things together. Anyone can put together a post or put together an ad. It's expensive to do. You, can't, you spend a lot of, you spend thousands of dollars on putting those posters out, putting those, um, those television ads out, but it's, and it's um, seductive in one regard because you can just go and get your graphic designer, your comms officer or an uh, agency to go and put it all together. But uh, it's often wasted money unless you know what the first bit is, what your promise is. Uh, and the visibility is important right? because no, none of your potential members are aware that you exist or that you've got coverage, then they're not going to join. So it is important to get visibility up. And now I'll talk a little bit later about what channel or what might be most appropriate, but you know, it's not always uh, one channel that, um, or that a simple channel that is the easy way. And by channel, I mean, is it? Better to do, you know, radio ads, or is it better to come post up in the workplace, billboards uh, around the place, uh, or uh, flood an area with organisers because that is an element of awareness that people walk around, or uh, you know, union t-shirts, union merchandise in the workplace, all elements of uh, the visibility. And it's easy to do; you can put together a t-shirt or a poster, uh, but might not be the best way to spend that money. Uh, the third part is delivery, and yeah, this is. Uh, a lot of unions uh, already tackle with this problem, but are you going to deliver on the promise? So it's you know one uh, question to go out there with your promise, uh, but can you actually deliver on it? Deliver on it, and your promise, your delivery might be your campaigning successes, it might be the organising, so some are actually um, winning on the ground, the health and safety issues, or saving a delegate who's been sacked. It might be bargaining, so can you actually uh, deliver on the collective agreements? And, or it might be with just the simple services. Your promise is that um, uh, is like a job insurance kind of promise. And if you can't actually deliver on that, then you've got a, you've got a problem. And the final bit is uh, the bridge. And this is where you get your growth. So you actually grow your membership. So you can, you've can you got your promise, you've got your uh, promise visible in, uh, in the, to your target audience, and you know that you can deliver on it, then uh, you can realize uh, benefits of that, and that's through the leverage. So it's loyalty. So we know that workplaces that have more delegates and activists and more members and get better outcomes, and that's part of the leverage actually delivering and uh, leveraging the, the benefits of what we've got. And then um, the extension side of that. So that, by that I mean, how do we leverage our workplace strength into other areas? that might be the campaigns or election campaigns and along those lines. But that's how you actually get your prevention. Uh, just on to the next slide, just a little, just a little bit more about the, um, uh, the promise. And one of, the, I suppose, one of the things that I would suggest to take away from this is to go back to your organisers and to your uh, the next council meeting or your committee of management meeting and ask, 
well, what is it that we as we can promise to our members? And see what, whether you, you get uh, the same answer from people. So, and go, go, to, your, go to your members, go to uh, potential members, what is it, what do you think we promise? When you join, or when you, you're considering joining, uh, what, what are we promising here? Uh, if you are finding that your staff internally, your organisers, can't articulate the same promise to you in one or two sentences, then um, that's where you know that, that, that you should be working on. If you, all your members know what your promise is, all your um, organisers can do it, then you're in a much better position than uh, a lot of members are. Uh, the other question would be, as a union, are you putting your budget in the areas of, that you're saying you're promising? So if you're a real you're a union that's going to campaign and you're saying that by joining us you're ensuring that we're going to defend this particular thing or that we're going to campaign on a particular issue, is your budget actually going to let you do that? So that's one of the key areas I think that um, you have to look at. Is you can look, just look simply at your, your budget. If it's all about organising, there's not a lot of money there for your delegate training or delegate development, then are you going to be able to deliver on the promise that you uh, so, go to the, um, the next slide, slide seven, where I'm talking about uh, choice. So, what kind of promise would you make? And I, I think that there's three. Or how would you define your promise if you don't, if people can't articulate it already? Uh, and I think there's three things really that are important to look at. And the first one is contrast. So, it's, it's inaction. It's action versus inaction. It's joining versus not joining. It's expect versus Disrespect. So you need to, when your promise should create a contrast between joining and not joining, or what is the thing that you want them to do versus uh, them not doing. And if you don't have a contrast, then uh, there's not a uh, very clear choice in the promise that you're, you're making or that you're asking people to sign up before you want to join. The promise and the choice that they're making needs to be simple. So I, can you sum it up in eight words? And that's what can be quite difficult, but if you're going to spend the time to do it, try to narrow that down to eight words will pay off. Because the simpler it is, the more uh, easy a job it will be for your delegates and organisers to go out there and sign up for So uh, a simple promise might have a verb, so you know, doing something, target audience, or target for, um, uh, so you know, your, your membership group, your membership area, the industry that you're working in, and then the outcome that you want. So, uh, and ideally it should be very good. Maybe that, that's quite hard to do. Uh, with unions ACT, uh, I try, you know, I try to do this, and we ended up with uh, we stand for working people. So, you know, it's, I could say it's a sort of fairly motherhood statement, but you know, unions as peak body does a lot of things. So, I'm trying to summarise that in uh, just a few words uh, took a bit of, bit of time to get people to agree on that. And finally, it needs to be bold, it needs to be controversial. So, best promises are controversial, and the reason why I say that is that the key to your, um, to that leverage, that growth, is about mobilising and activating and energising your supporters. So, making having a bold promise is going to energise them and make them want to, um, to, to jump on board. So, the, the, I use uh, often as an example, um, organisations that should talk ones that actually uh, have a really loyal, dedicated base of supporters. So the CFMU in Victoria is a really uh, clear example that they call controversy, but their members absolutely will uh, go to the end of the year for it. Same with the ETU uh, in Victoria, and they're a very controversial union, or they have been, uh, but they have an absolutely loyal membership base. Another example outside of the union movement might be Greenpeace. And Greenpeace caused a lot of controversy. They, you know, they climb the ice shard, they get arrested by the Russians on the world leaks. Uh, but they have, uh, despite all the controversy and the attacks and criticism, they have an absolutely fanatical loyal uh, supporter base. And um, every, uh, every bit of controversy they get into it actually swells uh, in the support because of the thing. Uh, Craig's contrast thing that they're doing is very simple to understand and um, their supporters and people who are inclined to support them again. I might just go to the next one uh, and I talked more about how can we understand our competition. 
And I think unions probably could do, uh, certainly in my experience, could do a bit more uh, in understanding just who our uh, competition are, because we've got a lot of competition and a lot of it we don't recognise as our competition. So I would say we've got um, competition that is direct, and then um, there's competition where there's where we don't really see what our competition is. So it's indirect, it's out there, but we, we don't treat it as competition. That's a real true problem. So a lot of petrol members' first point of call, particularly in, in um, white collar uh, industries, is the HR party. And that, they're a real competitor to joining a union. Why would you join a union if you can get all of that information for seemingly free from the HR department? A lot of workers don't view HR as the, the service for the horses. They see it as an impartial service. So the HR department in uh, companies is real uh, competition for unions. And also managers and supervisors. So a lot of uh, workers first, when they have an issue, will go to their supervisor rather than to the union and try to resolve their issue uh, with the boss. So that's, that's competition for joining the union, in my view. Competition is also talking with other co-workers and their friends and their family. You know, there's a lot of people put on Facebook. I'm having, to, you know, are any of my friends out there lawyers or no lawyers, or can I get some advice about what to do about not getting a pay slip or um, being asked to go to my first disciplinary meeting? And they go out and they ask for advice from their friends and family rather than coming. To me. And that's competition. Why would they join you? Pay dues, and they can get all that for free from uh, the from their, their boss or their friends or their family. Now, competition is also generous delegates. So your delegates uh, might give advice, good advice, uh, to non-members without them signing up. Then, you know, it's good that they're supporting their colleagues, but that means that the person doesn't necessarily join the union. So having a generous delegate going out there and doing work for non-members uh, is competition for us. We need to recognise that and part of it is training our delegates and making sure that everyone understands uh, that they need to join the union before they um, get assistance. The government is also a competitor, in particular the Fair Work Ombudsman. So a lot of people who uh, look up on the internet call their Fair Work Ombudsman uh, before they think that it's worth talking to the union. So that's uh, competition there. Finally, the internet. So what, 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 to Google a solution to their problem from the internet, and that's a really big um, uh, threat for us. And that's where I think that, talk about incipient uh, competition, so this is the disruptive stuff. And I might, uh, I think I will go into uh, that next, and just talk about the incipient threats, which is the next slide, slide number nine. Uh, it's disruptive, and by disruptive, that means, we talked about this ICT Congress, but Business models uh, get disrupted by the internet and by these new, new technologies. And our business model is that we ask people to join, so we've got a membership business model before they can get the benefits of joining. So whether that's the campaigning or the organising benefit or the uh, servicing benefit, the, the highest threshold that we've got is that they need a, a, a new paying member. And the internet really does lower the um, lower the costs for other people to enter into this space. And I'll just give you two examples in other areas uh, to show just how easy it would be for a hostile uh, organisation to come out and really seriously disrupt our uh, model. First one is Rocket Lawyer. And if you, when you go back to your office of a night when Andy, look up Rocket Lawyer, or we'll do this search for Rocket Lawyer. This is an organisation in the US where you can go on to this website for free and download uh, any kind of legal document. You put in, you can type in your details. So you say, I want to have a, um, a lease agreement. So I'm a small business and I want to have a, uh, a sublet agreement. And rather than go to a lawyer, I can go to Rocket Lawyer and type in my business name, term, six month lease, the, what I, you know, all the different things you might need to know. It's all for free. It's created by lawyers. And at the end, it spits out the legal document that you don't need to see a lawyer about. Now, their business model is you can pay uh, 400 bucks a lawyer that they refer your work to, will check it for you. 
but you don't need to do that. You can get it all for free. At the end, you just take it, you know, like that um, document is, is um, sufficient to stand up. But if you're a law, you're a, a lawyer working in the US, you suddenly have to compete not just with all those other lawyers that are offering their services. You have to compete with free. How do you compete with free? You're asking someone to pay your time, you know, 200 bucks an hour or 150 bucks an hour for you to do this work, or they could just go onto a website and get it all for free and pay a cent. So that is a seriously disruptive business model, and you can just imagine how that could be applied to union issues. So sometimes they're dismissed, they don't know what their uh, legal entitlements are, or maybe redundant, or something along those lines. Some hostile organisation or the Abbott government could create all of an uh, entire uh, industrial platform for free for uh, working people. Second one is Coursera. And this is a, uh, a disruptive thing for universities. And so Coursera is a online university. Where they have the, um, the Ivy League university professors providing online courses for uh, nothing. So you can go on, you can do a advanced mathematics, do uh, art direction, or you could do uh, history, or uh, law courses. Courses are provided for the academics doing the courses are uh, Ivy League, they're uh, Yale, they're Harvard. Uh, so you're getting very high quality uh, academic uh, input. You can opt into doing uh, assessment, which is then marked uh, for free. And at the end of it, you've got a choice of you can either get a little certificate that says you've completed it, or you can pay to say that you've got a some kind of accreditation. So that's their business model. Why would you, if you, if you're a, not if you're a, if you're a, if you're a so they've got their reputation. If you're a community college in the US or a small university, how can you compete with that? You can, it's very, very disruptive. So once again, you can just imagine the, Risk for unions, where a hostile organisation provides all of the information that the working person would need in the event that they've got a problem with a boss or a or sack or if it's not issued, and it's all there for free uh, on some kind of So it's very big risks that we're facing once we um, start the So those, that's why I thought I talked about what, what is competition. And if you just go to the next slide, why do we care about this? This is kind of stuff that I can't talk about. But these kinds of things really allow for uh, the traditional uh, role of unions as gatekeepers to industrial information to be bypassed. So, you know, if Abbott was serious about uh, destroying the union, then he'd give a million bucks to some of one of these app companies and say, go and create a version of what for the unions, and make it available for free and promote it like hell, put ads on, put, you know, uh, have apps and do all that, that kind of stuff. And we would find a very difficult to um, um, respond to that. Now, some unions might respond to that um, better than others, but um, if you look at where the youth uh, membership is out at the moment, the national is about 8%, it would be that, that's the, the future for us that we don't respond to this kind of the other problem about this model, this um, kind of disruptive uh, competition, is that it's free. So we're asked to produce, and uh, it significantly lowers the expectations of working people to what uh, what they should be paying for industrial advice or servicing, or even getting involved in um, campaigns. Because the other risk for us isn't just at the industrial servicing side of this campaign, and we'll all be a Another, you, might, you might be aware that there's another organisation called Coworker, and these are online um, petition platforms. But if I just might just give a quick anecdote just to illustrate the um, point that I'm making is in Queensland, um, at the Brisbane Airport, there was a dispute that United Voice had with the airport over the cleaning. And they uh, were there was a terrible contractor, the airport wouldn't meet with them, the contractor told them to uh, piss off. So they um, created a petition online uh, and promoted it uh, with passengers saying that um, there was a serious problem uh, with, the clean, with the cleaning contractor at uh, the airport. Now, when they did that, they got something like 10,000 people signed this uh, petition. It seems to me every time someone signed a sent an email to the CEO of the airport, the CEO of the airport 
yeah, I've met with the union, it's not the issue. Now, if you're a worker, looking at that, there's no reason that you could do all of that without the union involvement. So you could set up a petition on Change Shop or, or Coworker or any one of those free online platforms. If you've just been unfairly dismissed or you've, um, there's an issue in your workplace, you can do all of that without being involved. So it's not just at the industrial side, but it's also at the organising and campaigning side that we are facing uh, significant disruptive risk uh, for our uh, uh, type of way that we, we operate. Uh, and also, finally, it allows members to shop around. So they might get, even if they're already a member, they might shop around and try to get different, they don't like our advice, and they uh, try to find other advice and uh, it causes can imagine the those uh, issues where they decide that they like the other advice better than the union. So this is why I think that it's really important that we uh, grapple with this and get a handle on it, uh, because uh, there will be, at some point, whether it's in 12 months or five years, there'll be someone that uh, cottons on and this is um, the way that they can really seriously um, So the next kind of uh, I might just skip over the next one slide, uh, two slides, which is about targeting, um, because I think that different unions have different views about who you should target. Uh, if you're going, my view is just very quickly say so, um, the, the key in dealing with digital campaigning and um, going into areas, uh, particularly with young people, or people in the economy, so um, areas that aren't traditionally organised, activism is the key. I think that we need to focus on identifying people who are. Um, our supporters and um, getting them uh, engaged with us. So, you know, it's the high activism uh, low density sites that we should be focusing on in these kinds of areas. But I don't think that would surprise many of you to hear that, so I'm going to turn it I might just go uh, to slide 13 where I just talk about um, the, the uh, three, what I call the three iron model of communication. So, it's quite a lot of research research and research that corporations do about what uh, is effective communication. And uh, uh, this particular, um, these particular laws come from a, a study uh, that was done, an academic study, but uh, it was based on some neurological and neuroscience research about what actually affects the brain most. So uh, that's why I've used these particular laws. Uh, I think the first one is Particularly if you're talk, thinking about your positioning and the promise that you've made, you need to uh, get notice. So you're talking about uh, yep, uh, awareness there. And uh, getting into the mind, so actually being where the person uh, is. So you need to actually get into their mind first. That uh, is the first law. Second law is being uh, relevant. So this is where you need to be unique. You need to have um, uh, address the need that I talked about. So if you're talking about something that's um, of no if you're talking about safety because of the safety issues in the workplace, then you're not really addressing the need of that, um, that worker. So it needs to, your, your messages need to be uh, focused on a need. And the need might not be functional. So when I talk about safety, that's why I just people talk about functional versus the symbolic uh, need. So people might join because they want um, a pay rise and there's a bargaining period coming up or they've just been had an issue and they want uh, representation. But there's symbolic needs or values-based needs. A lot of people might join because it's the right thing to do or they, they believe in unionism or they believe in a particular issue. And so the, when we talk about our promises, they don't need to be functionally based. They don't need to be based on the service or the, the specific uh, thing uh, or the benefit that we're providing. It might be an emotional or a values-based need that we're identifying. So I just want to um, say that there's two different types of ways that we can uh, be relevant to our members. The final thing, and really this is I think one of the most important ones, is repetition and being consistent. So a lot, my experience is that um, unions spend a lot of money on campaigns, particularly bargaining campaigns, and after four months, five months of that, kind of sort of say, oh, members are getting sick of this, or I've heard this before, we need to talk about something, we need to talk about it. And a lot of you would know the anecdotal or the thing that I think that's the thing that you would hear. If you hear this message that is line one or two or one, then that's about the time that people will start to pay attention. And Tony Abbott is the classic example. 
that is a stop quote, uh, tax to tax. The fact that he says the same thing over and over for three years about the carbon price, all he said was tax to tax. And that cut through. And it cut through because of the repetition. And we know that that affects the brain more than people hear the same message over and over again. It uh, has a physical effect on how, how we think. And, uh, so sticking with the same line, and I'm not talking about slogans here, but the same message, the same promise for years is really important. Because if we keep changing every 12 months or every uh, couple of months or every one or two years time, uh, then uh, and we know it also, I think, once again, I'm just only with you because we instinctively we know this. One of the reasons why the Real Rights Work campaign was effective was because for three years we just said, Real Rights Work. Ran into problems and we stopped talking about that. We talked about some things after the election. A whole bunch of other reasons. There was a problem, but one of the reasons was we stopped talking about the rights of work. We started talking about other things. So competi- uh, co- repetition and consistency is really important, uh, particularly across a whole bunch of uh, different mediums, different channels. So we were, we were talking about the t shirts, uh, union merchandise, and the uh, other the website. And, Advertising campaigns and might run billboards and the rest of it. If, if it's not consistent, you're, being, you're creating um, dissonance, and so people can't connect uh, to things. So when I was at Slater and Paul, I saw this first time, and um, you know, you'd be aware, it's a pretty big law firm, well, they would run the same uh, ads constantly and get saturation, so it's top of mind, put them out where people would um, see them, so they would get them noticed. And they had the same message all the time for years and years and years of the same campaign that we did. And corporations know it. They understand it. You know, Peter Jackson, Donald's haven't changed their slogan in 20 years. That's the reason. I might just go to the, the next slide, and this is about intervention points. Um, so I mentioned or I alluded to this right at the start about there's different things that we do at different times, so different leaders, and um, uh, it's a bit, I'm going to sound a little bit uh, kind of corporate here, but um, this is, a, the, the slide that you're seeing is the decision chain. So it's, when someone has a problem at work, uh, are they aware, so you go there, are they, are they aware that the union if they aren't, then they will never join the union. Simple as that, because they don't even have any workers on the campus. So the kind of intervention or the lever that you would call at that point is about uh, awareness. Because you know you can get your your fact that you exist out there. So that might be organisers out on the ground, it might be uh, stuff in the workplace most for uh, posters and stickers or something like that. But you're, if no one is aware that the union exists, then the thing that you need to do is promote the union. So if they are aware that you exist, then they need to have a preference. Are they uh, inclined to join or not? And if they aren't inclined to join, then they're not going to join. So, not going to join. so when I talk about price there, I'm not talking about membership dues, I'm talking about what is the co- what do they see as the cost to them for joining. So some people might perceive the cost as their job. If they join the union, they might get the sack. They might see the price of the cost uh, to them joining as the, the membership dues. They might see some other kind of cost uh, to it. So uh, membership dues is one of the things, and I think that probably around 1% of the um, workers income is about the um, price. But uh, there are other costs. If we don't understand what that cost is, then it's even in their mind then we're not going to get them to form a preference to join, uh, to, to seek out the union. So let's say, so they've got a problem, I know the union exists, they're inclined to join. So then they need to actually intend, have a form an intention. So they can not do that and then they're never going to join, or they can. So once again, this is the um, price, so making sure that they understand what the cost is and if that is, um, if they can overcome that barrier, and promotion is the second one. Uh, at this, the, the practical thing for unions at this point is an organiser in, in the workplace. So uh, the intention to join, so they need someone generally, the most effective way that we know is obviously having an organiser or a delegate or a co-worker explain to them um, to 
promote the union to them. The union's a fantastic way of helping out. We want to get respect and all the to join. We need to get them to attend, to join. And then the final bit is the availability. So that's been, we need to actually be physically there, available for them to join. So uh, that's the final intervention. So there's diff uh, different points uh, that we have uh, along the decision tree of a potential member actually ending up joining is we'll decide the different types of intervention. So if you're spending all your time uh, putting organisers uh, out on the ground, uh, that might not necessarily be the most important thing. The most important thing if you don't get barriers or wings. So you might say in a new greenfield site, the most important thing we need to do is to get the wings. So that might be uh, letterboxing in a particular uh, uh, region if you're in a regional area. Uh, it might be saturating the local area with um, uh, flyers or something along those lines. It might be standing at the front of the workplace and lifting so that they know people exist. So if we need a system barrier, then that's the intervention. So the main point here is that we have different tools to use at different times and decisions. Uh, and so just the next slide is really just um, coming through each of those. So what I, when I talk about the um, product and what actually is the mission, it really comes down to your promise. So what are, you, what, are they, what are they signing up for? What is the product that they're signing up for? the promise that they're, they're buying? And if that's not right, if, they don't, if that doesn't address a need for them, then they're not going to do it. So it's not going to talk about what actually is the mission. Uh, the final bit that I'm, I'll talk about is uh, that, that leverage stuff that I talked about. So this is slide 16. Um, there's loyalty. So I'm, I'm not, what we know, uh, certainly um, when I was involved with the Obama campaign and doing things with, um, with Greenpeace, what we know is that uh, it is the loyal supporters that are the key to, to growth. They're the ones that go out and do things. So these are our delegates, they're our activists, we know this, but uh, we, don't we might not know it in a systematic way. So there's um, uh, a thing called a net promoter score, and I've written about it today. I've got a, uh, a website. Uh, perhaps um, Tim can send around a link to this, but there's a thing called a net promoter score, and it's a really useful, simple tool unions can use to understand where we sit with our members and are they, most of our, is our membership as a whole more likely to encourage or uh, say, suggest to uh, their friends, their co-workers that they join the union or not? And if we, if we don't know that, then it's very difficult for us to understand the loyalty driving our membership. Uh, the good thing about the Net Promoter Score, uh, and I won't go into exactly how it's calculated, but um, I've more written about this, is that it's, it's actionable. You can break it down into individual workplaces or um, membership uh, demographics and cohorts that you might have, so um, work sites or um, regions, uh, and say so this particular area, there's a lot of um, Net Promoters that so they're talking really positively about us. Well, if they're not, if they're, you're, you find that you've got uh, a work site that is a net detractor rather than a net promoter, and that you know that you, you're not going to see a lot of growth from that. You can try to turn the big different things that you can do to try to turn it around. The other, uh, I think there's one takeaway that I suggested is that um, trying to find out if your organisers and your members can articulate what your promise is. The other question that I might pose for you is do you know how much it costs to sign up a member? What is the lifetime value of a member? So this is one thing that not-for-profits do really well is that they understand the cost to recruitment of a new donor and they're willing, what they're willing to spend. So for example, uh, for an organisation like Greenpeace, they might say that in the lifetime, their lifetime for a supporter might be three years and that person will bring in, say, 1,500 bucks as a uh, over the lifetime as a supporter. So they're willing to spend $600 to recruit a new donor. What is that for your union? What is the, what is the cost of signing someone up, a new member? 
and what is the lifetime value of that member? So do you know what the average uh, duration of membership is for your, uh, across your union? When I was working with the MTA, we, we found that there was um, there were key tipping points that uh, that we had with the membership. So if a member uh, didn't resign in the first 12 months, then they were likely to remain a member for, for three years. But then we found there was a drop off after three years, but they survived that three year period, then they were likely to be a member for about 10 years. So that allowed us to have interventions before the 12 month point. So you know, going out, having organisers have a conversation, a phone call with that person to get them over the 12 month point. So we knew that they survived 12 months and they would survive for three years. Then we looked at all the members that have been uh, two and a half years, he said we need to have another conversation, another contact uh, with that cohort of members to get them over the three year period and uh, allow them to go into uh, the uh, past three year point, which point they would likely remain a member for uh, over, over seven years to up to ten years. And a lot of we know about churn and we know about retention is really important, but uh, if we don't understand what our cost to recruitment is and what our lifetime uh, value is, then there's actually not a, uh, any uh, systematic calculation that we can make about where, where to uh, invest. Is it better to invest in retaining members or is it better to invest in signing up new members? You might find, once you do this calculation, that uh, you should be putting more money into, say, member services and keeping those members than uh, signing new members up. There's um, studies that show that uh, for every 10% increase in retention that you get with uh, membership, that their lifetime value, that the member's lifetime value actually increases by up to 200%. So that uh, can change the calculation for your unit uh, with the way you put your money. Obviously we want growth, but one of the ways that we can grow is by keeping the members that you do so, And retention and churn, a lot of industries is a massive issue. I know that there's Industry reasons for that, so you know, these are high turnover industries, uh, a lot of them, and we've talked about the reason why they start. Uh, for that, people don't see it as a career, they might work in a call centre, they might be a cleaner just for uh, six months. But, um, those are also things that we can do uh, to, to drive that. Uh, and I'll finish up just talking about digital. So I'll just go on to the uh, slide. 17 and 18, and just talk about why, if your union isn't investing in digital campaigning and digital tools, then I think it's really high time to seriously consider this. Uh, so we've got some stats there. 92% of Australians have access to the internet in their home. So there's some that don't. This is across the board, so we know that uh, whether it's blue collar, white collar, we know that it's uh, rural and regional or cities that uh, they're very if, if not the highest we've got the top three most saturated uh, use of the internet in the world. You know that 62% of people use the use email access to email on a daily basis and the prevalence of smartphones now has just exceeded uh, any what, what we thought even five years ago. So uh, even uh, so 68% of people use the um, use email and access the internet using the mobile device. So this has fundamentally changed how, for example, even Google and Facebook work with you know, digital natives, but they everything used to be on the computer or the desktop, and now they all their focus has changed to being on uh, the mobile device, whether that's uh any uh, uh, and media consumption is dramatically changed. So one of the reasons why traditional media organisations like Fairfax and News Corp and Channel 10 and all the rest of them are in such uh, dire straits is because the audiences are stopping reading the newspaper, they're not, reading, uh, they're not watching traditional, uh, they're not watching movies on the TV anymore. They're um, increasingly consuming media uh, on on a mobile device or a tablet or even you know, on, on, on a desktop. And the final thing is dual screen media consumption. And I, the reason that I'm talking about these things is because these are areas that present fundamental opportunities 
to be is how we communicate with our vendors, our potential vendors, and our suppliers, potential suppliers. So dual screen media consumption means that you just think about when you when you watch the telly at night time or when you check reading the um, the newspaper in the morning, uh, a lot of people pull out their mobile phone or uh, their tablet and they're, while they're watching the second theater report or master chef or something like that, they're checking Facebook, sending an email, uh, looking at Twitter, or looking for any other people who are using Instagram or something like those ones. But we're no longer consuming media just on a single way. We're, uh, we're using multiple platforms. So for unions, the opportunities uh, for us, rather than all being bad news about those disruptive things I'm talking about, so if we put on the slide, uh, it really is about benefits uh, for us. So we can now, more cheaply than ever, target audiences, particular audiences, like never before. So it can be really finely uh, tuned. We can now, for example, do Facebook messaging and, uh, and advertising to only to the people who really work in our industries. Because people put on Facebook all kinds of um, personal information about where they work, the company they work for, the industry they work for, or their, even their physical location. So you, you can, uh, if you've got a great big mind, and it's the only, the only game in town, you can geo-target ads based on a very small kilometre radius uh, for those, those people. The other really important thing is that we can base things on behaviour, so you know, things like clicks or uh, purchasing decisions or uh, other, you know, whether they walk into a particular shopping centre, whether they walk into a particular geographical area, based on their behaviour, so we can target them really finely grained and the corporate sector is really good at this, they're getting incredibly smart by the target consumers and all those tools are now cheap and available for us to use. It's really quick, we don't need to spend a huge amount of time like we used to when we were running TV ads for Europe to work, spending um, weeks or months developing our creative or figuring out what our, our target is, we can actually, when a, a crisis or some, something hits, we can be out there within minutes. Uh, responding to it. So think about if you're having a dispute with a boss and they send out their, uh, an email or they send out some kind of uh, letter or uh, you know, put something out on the worksite uh, notice board, we don't need to um, just take days or weeks to respond to that. We can actually go out on the same day within uh, hours uh, and target people both uh, sending messages straight to their, their phones or their, uh, their emails or Facebook or other platforms that they're using to, uh, to communicate with their And it also allows us to work with In the old days, we did this kind of communication. We really didn't know who we to communicate with the right audience. But these new digital tools allow us to know for, for sure that we're talking to the right people. So it's really clear. And uh, it is all available for us. So you don't, um, you do need to invest in it for a, a union. And this is, I think, one area that uh, peak bodies can really assist with for unions that might not have this uh, resource in house but want to, to use it. Uh, is a, a something that peak bodies can look at uh, providing these kinds of um, uh, technical expertise. But it does require, of course, the firms to want that and to invest in it. So that's it for me. Those are the things, two key things I think, uh, I think would be worth you considering. Would be, uh, firstly, is your promise to your members clear? Can you articulate it? Can the organisers articulate it? Can your delegates explain what it is in eight words? And what is the, the cost to sign up from a member? What is the lifetime value of signing up uh, of, of a member? And can you know what that is? Or is it easily available? Because that will decide uh, a lot on the kind of uh, interventions and different tools 